Now available from Desktop Images. The LightWave 3D Essentials Series, featuring special effects animator and LightWave Pro editor John Gross. This series takes you step by step through all of LightWave's powerful tools, including modeling, surfacing, animation, special effects, and more. Fundamental skills that are a must for any LightWave animator. The creative magic of Ron Thornton is unveiled by the master of CGI special effects himself. See how traditional production techniques are applied to computer graphics for modeling, surfacing, compositing, and special effects in broadcast and film production. Discover a variety of tips and tricks for creating explosive effects in pyro techniques. Brad Peebler demonstrates the ins and outs of particle explosions, smoke trails, billowing fireballs, and fire image mapping, effects that add impact to your action. Lightwave pioneer Tony Stutterheim reveals professional applications for animated logo design in pro-flying logo techniques. From building logo objects and time-saving tips and tricks, to creative motion and background treatments, powerful procedures for creating stunning 3D animated logos. All available now from Desktop Images. Dear Video Professional, The elements of this videotape represent the work of creative professionals like yourself. Unauthorized duplication of this tape not only is a federal crime, but also contributes to the destruction of an industry that you help create. Please do your part by not duplicating this videotape. Thank you. I'm John Gross. You know, there's a lot of buttons in LightWave. So many, in fact, that you might not use them all, and a lot of them that you don't understand their use. In this tape, we're going to go through LightWave on a panel-by-panel -panel basis and talk about some of the more powerful features of some of these buttons. Why don't we dive right in? The first thing we're going to do is go into the scene panel, load up a scene called toys.lws. It's located in the games directory on the NewTech CD-ROM. And basically, this is a scene that consists of a tricycle, a wagon, a pogo stick, etc. Just a couple of different toy objects. Now, one of the features I want to talk about is in the scene panel. The scene overview here lists all of the different objects in your scene. If you click on the areas here, it highlights and selects that object. But the important thing about this is if you click on the object icon or the camera icon um, located in the farthest leftmost column, you can keep selecting different colors for the wireframes of these objects. For instance, if I'm working on the ball a lot, I might want to change that to a different color. So when I go back to the scene panel, notice that it's highlighted as green. Now remember that the current object is always yellow. So even if I pick this, and I'm using the middle mouse button to select that ball, notice as soon as it's highlighted, it becomes yellow as well. But when it's not highlighted, it will remain in the wireframe colors that I've chosen in the scene overview. There are eight different colors you can choose from to help you differentiate between your different objects. This makes it really handy to separate out your objects and easy to pick them as well. 
Also on the scene panel, we have a couple of different items which are really handy. The first frame, last frame values, of course, set up your first frame and last frame in the scene. But one of the things you can do with these is, let's say you have two systems, for instance. You can set your first frame value to, say, 50, your last frame value to 1, and your frame step to a negative number, such as negative 1. What this will do is when you start rendering, you'll start rendering frame 50, and then you'll render frame 49, frame 48, etc. This is handy if you have a couple different machines. You might start one starting at frame one rendering up, and another machine at the last frame rendering down, and they'll meet somewhere in the middle. Okay, a couple other items we have here. The shift keys and scale all keys. This is really handy when you've set up a scene Let's say you, you've set up an animation and you've designed it to run at 30 frames per second for NTSC video. Well, let's say now that you need to go to film with it, and film is at 24 frames per second. All you have to do, let's for instance, let's say our scene is 1 to 120, which is a four second animation at 30 frames per second. Let's say if we want to change that to 24 frames per second, we can do a scale all keys. This will ask you, if you are you sure you want to do this because it's going to affect all the motions and envelopes say yes, I can set a low frame and a high frame value, and I'm going to scale all frames by 0 0.8. 0 0.8 is the value to use when you want to go from 30 frames to 24 frames. Hit OK. Notice our last frame immediately changes to 96, and if you multiply 24 by 4, that equals 96. Conversely, if you want to go the opposite way, you've set up a scene at 24 frames per second, and you wish to go to 30 frames per second, you can do a scale all keys, and choose for your scale frames by value 1.25. That will bump our last frame up to 120, shift everything out so you're, you're at 30 frames per second rate. There's also another value on the interface called frames per second. Now what this does, you may think that this is involved in converting from 30 frames per second to 24 or vice versa, but what it really does is it adjusts the internal timing of light waves uh, texture velocities. For instance, let's say we are in the surfaces panel and we've set up a texture that has a texture velocity. Let's just say we're using a fractal noise texture. And we've set up a texture velocity that is moving at uh, 0.5 units per frame. Since LightWave uses the metric system, a value of 0.5 means half a meter per frame. At 30 frames per second, that would equal 15 meters per second. So, Let's say we've set this up, our velocity is 15 meters per second, but now we go and we scale all of our frames so we're down to 24 frames per second. That would mean, basically, that our textures would be moving too fast. They'd be moving at 15 meters per second, but at 30 frames per second. Okay? So if we go back to the scene panel and input a value of 24 for the frames per second, you're telling LightWave's internal clock that a second is now 24 frames as opposed to 30. Therefore, your textures will work at the same rate that you are viewing them at 30 frames. There is one little known feature in the frames per second value, and that relates to wireframe playbacks. If we were to generate a wireframe preview, and we'll just do a bounding box. Let's make it 60 frames just so it'll go quick. Notice that our frame rate is in values of 30, basically. We have 3, 6, 10, 15, and 30. We also have a 24 just to get the film rate. However, if we are using LightWave on a PAL system, 30 frames per second doesn't mean a whole lot to us. If we go into the scene panel and change this to 25, which in PAL is 25 frames per second is the video rate, and I go and generate a preview now, do a bounding box again, notice that my frame rate values have been scaled to match the PAL rates. So our upper value is now at 25, and we're cutting down in half. So that's a nice feature of the frames per second. Let's go, and we'll just change that back to 30. Again, remember that this doesn't change how fast anything renders or anything like that. This is only to change LightWave's internal clock, primarily for the texture velocities. Next, so let's go into Objects panel and talk about some of the features in there. And one of the first things I want to talk about is object skeletons, or bones. Let's go into Modeler and make a very simple object that we can use bones to displace. And I'm going to just go in here, make a cylinder. 
along this face view. Going to use the comma key to zoom out a little bit, stretch this out like so. All right, we'll make it about there. And I'm going to go into the numeric requester and give it a number of segments, let's say 10. Okay, hit enter to make that. Okay, that will work for what we want. I'm just going to save this. Let's go into our new tech objects directory. And I'm just going to save this as cylinder.lwl. Minimize lit modeler, go back into layout. Let's just clear this scene. Go to the objects panel and load up our cylinder object. Okay, so we basically have a multi-segmented cylinder. I'm going to add two bones to this so in order to displace it. Let's go to the objects panel. Cylinder is the current object. Go to object skeleton. I'm going to add a bone and let's hit continue. Go back to layout, see where that bone is. I'm going to use the comma key to zoom in a little bit here. I'm in the top view. There's our bone right there. And I'm just going to select objects, bones, okay. I'm going to take this and change the rest length of this bone so it's about half the length of the cylinder. Now, when you're sizing bones here to determine the rest length, make sure to use the rest length button and not size. Size will actually displace the object with it. By changing the rest length of the bone, what you're doing is changing the area of influence that that bone exerts. So I'm making this bone this rest length, going to move it, and I'm just going to move it along the z-axis to push it near the front of the cylinder. Once I have this bone in place, I'm going to create a key for it right there. And now a quick keyboard shortcut to get into the bones panel is just hitting the P key on the keyboard. That will bring up the panel for whatever current item you have selected. And I'm going to add a child bone. Adding the child bone automatically adds a bone that is parented to the first bone and is positioned right at the end of it. So now we have our two bones in the scene. This bone, I don't have to go through the setup of parenting it because I've added it as a child. And by the way, the keyboard equivalent for adding a child bone is the equal sign right up here. Some more handy keyboard shortcuts when working with bones, or all items for that matter, are the plus and minus keys on the numeric keypad. Also, you can use the plus and minus keys at the top of the, the numbers as well. Basically, let's say we want to get rid of this bone that is currently selected. I can hit the minus key on the numeric keypad, and that's going to ask me if I want to clear that. This is the, also works the same for objects. If I have an object selected, it will ask me if I want to clear that. All I have to do, I'm going to clear it here, so I'm going to say yes, but instead of clicking on the yes button, I can hit the enter key on the keyboard or the return key. I can also hit the escape key if I want to say no. So let's just hit enter to say yes. And instead of going back into the skeleton panel and adding a child bone there, I can add it with a numeric keyboard shortcut by hitting the equals key next to the backspace key. That will add that. Notice it's a child bone because it's positioned at the end of the first bone. I'm going to create a key here by hitting the enter key and then hit enter again to create it. So I've set up my two bones. Now, the first thing we have to do after we've positioned our bones is assign them rest positions. I can either go into the bone panel, I'm going to hit P, and I can select bone active, or from the layout window, I can just hit the R button. I'm going to select this first bone. Notice I'm using the middle mouse button to select this and just hit the R key and that sets the bone as an active bone. Notice the dotted line turns into a solid line. Let's select the next bone. And because I have bone selected already, I'm just going to use the down arrow to go to the next bone. And hit R to make that one active as well. Now, let's go to the side view. Now when I move one of these bones, because they're active, and we're just going to rotate, let's just select pitch. Notice that it deforms the object. Okay. Well, a couple other things we need to know about this. Let's go back to the bone panel. And we have a couple values here that work really well with bones. Notice we have a rest length value. This was changed interactively when I was changing in layout, but I can also type that in. But the values I have here are scale strength by rest length and strength. By default, bones have a strength of 1. However, if we increase that strength, and I'm going to type in 5 here. And notice what I did there, by the way. I double-clicked on here. That will highlight the whole 
the whole value and I can just type in a new value and hit return. Conversely, I can put the cursor just in front of the value and type in a new value and then hit return and that clears out the old one. Let's put in a value of 5, hit continue. Now when I rotate this bone, notice that the strength is stronger and more of the object is going along with the bone. If I want to maintain this part of the object with this bone more, what I can do, and I'm just going to slide the frame slider to reset that, I'm going to go back, hit P to go into the bone panel, go to the first bone, and let's assign that a larger strength. Let's put in 10 for that one. So now when I move the second bone, I'm going to rotate that up, notice what's happening. This part of the object is staying very still because this bone has a higher strength. It affects the object more than this bone does. Okay, I'm going to go back and set both of these strengths back to 1. Which is the default. Now we also have a value that says scale strength by rust length. What that means is, let's say for instance, that we're going to go ahead and let's pretend that this is an arm and I want to avoid the pinching that occurs here when the arm is bent up all the way. So what we really need to do is add another bone in here to help define that. So let's just take this bone, change the rest length so it's very small. The smaller the rest length, the less the area of influence of the bone. What I'm going to do is go back to the bone panel and turn on limited range to actually show you what the range of the strength is. By default, limited range is off, which means a bone affects all points of an object. However, if we turn limited range on, bones will only affect the areas that are involved in that range. And again, this is in the metric system, so we have a minimum range value and a maximum. Let's look at the maximum range right here is set to 1. Okay. Notice how the area of influence is kind of spherical shaped. When I change that rest length, notice that the influence range changes as well. The influence range is always kind of a cold capsule shape around the bone. Okay. Now, if I were to leave it like this, when I adjust this, when I rotate the bone, only that area within that influence range is affected. Notice this area out here isn't affected whatsoever by the bone. Okay. Well, since we also have a minimum and maximum range, let's go back into the panel. If we set these values to the same, I'm going to set minimum to 1, maximum to 1 meter. Okay. Notice what happens here. That area of the object goes completely with the bone and we get this pinching area right here that falls outside of the range. Okay, so let's go back to what I was doing before. I'm going to change the rest length of this bone, make it very tiny, okay, which basically gives us a spherical limited range. I'm going to go back to the bone panel, and I'm going to change the minimum and maximum range values here. Let's make this 0.75. Notice what happened when I changed the maximum range to less than what the minimum was. It automatically went to that as well. Okay. I just want to be just outside the object. Okay, that's looking good. Now I'm going to add a child bone to this bone right here. I'm going to hit the equals key to add the child bone. Now notice the child bone was added, but it's very small. The rest length is very short, just like the parent bone. Okay, this bone is already selected, the one I just added. So I'm going to change the rest length of that and fill that out so it goes to the end, like so. And I'm also going to move it along the z-axis slightly to offset it. Let's change the rest length, get it just like that. I'm going to create a key for it there. Okay. Now basically what we're doing, let's go back to our first bone as well, go into the bones panel, give this a limited range. And let's make this 0.75 for both values. Okay, so everything has the same limited range values, 0.75. Notice we have three bones, this one. And we can actually change the rest length of this bone. What I'm trying to do here is get the limited ranges so they just fall into each other. Okay, we have the middle bone. Let's select the end bone. I'm using the middle mouse button to select these. Change the rest length on this and also slide it down a bit. About like so. Okay, let's create a key for that item. Let's create a key for this bone. 
create a key for that bone. Okay, so now what we've done is we've set up basically an elbow joint here in the middle that's going to try to maintain that area of the object from pinching like a garden hose. So now when we affect this, let's say this is our forearm, when we rotate this bone up, notice what happens. Okay, we're having some problems here because the limited range area is too small, so not all of the object is falling in that. So I'm just going to take a look at that from the top. Okay. Okay, we see what's happening. Oh, uh, another problem is because I've moved my bones around, I need to reset uh, where they're active at. Because I've moved them and created new keys, but I had them active in another area, LightWave's assuming that I want to displace the bone. So let's just go through all the bones since I've moved them. I'm going to hit the R key to set up the new rest position. Go back to the bones. So bone 1, bone 2, R. On three, hit R. Okay, now I've set up new rest positions. So what that means is any time the bones are moved from these new positions, light wave is going to deform the object. Now when we rotate, okay, this is getting to be more of what we want. Notice this area in the middle is, is staying still. However, this area isn't quite right. So if we were actually doing this and this was an arm, what we might do is not only rotate this up, pitch this up, we might actually move it along the Y axis as well something like that okay so we're trying to maintain that that middle area and keeping it keeping it from pinching okay now notice we get this little kink right here a way around that is to give a larger bone strength to this middle bone so let's reset the bones here if we select that bone remember all my strengths are set to one okay well this one I can make larger let's make this five that's saying that this bone in the middle is having more influence over these points than this bone will because both of these bones exert influence over the points that are shared in this area. So now if we select that one, rotate it up, and again we'd want to be moving it when we rotate. See what's happening? We're getting rid of that kink area because the middle bone is exerting more influence and acting as an anchor for those points. Okay, well there's one other option in the bones panel and that's the scale strength by rest length. All that does is, if you select that, let's say we're using that middle bone which has the very small rest length, okay? And that's the one we turn scale strength on for. Basically what's going to happen is, as the rest length of the bone diminishes, the strength will as well because we're scaling that strength by the rest length. It's going to use this as a multiplier and the bone's gonna be less strong. If you use versions of LightWave prior to 4.0, that's what's happening. When you make the rest length very short, the bone exerts less influence over the points because the strength of it is smaller. Now we can pull that out and make the strength of the bone independent of the rest length. Remember that bones are saved as part of a scene file and not part of an object file. If you create an item that uses bones, let's say it's a human figure and you have bones for the arms and the fingers and whatnot, and obviously that's taking you a long time to set up. After you save the scene and then you want to load this object into a new scene, complete with all of its bones, you need to go to the objects panel and use the load from scene button. Load from scene will load in the object with all its bones, with all the motions of those objects and bones, so you don't have to go through and set those up again. Also, if you want to use the same bone set for a different item, let's say you have a, an object that's a man that has bones in it, and then you want to do the same thing but for a woman object, what you can do is just use the replace object button to replace the man object with the woman, but the bone structure will stay intact. Next, let's talk about multiple morph targets. To do that, we first need to go into Modeler and create a couple items to morph. So I'm going to go into Modeler here. Let's clear out what we have. And we're just going to make some very simple ball objects to morph between, just to demonstrate what we're going to talk about here. Okay, let's just make this, give it a few more segments. Let's say 30 sides, 15 segments. A good ballpark for sides and segments is keep the segments value half of the sides value. Say OK here. Actually, let's center this up at 0, 0, 0. And another little trick that you can do when you're using the Windows version of LightWave is that, let's say I want to use this value for all of these. 
instead of typing it in, I could hit Control and C to copy that. And then I can go here, highlight that, and use Control V to paste it in. And I can do that for all the values. That way I don't have to keep typing it in if I wish. Say OK. Hit Enter. That creates my object. OK. Let's save this as ball1.lwl. Now I'm just going to modify it a bit. I don't want to add any new data to it because then our morphs won't work. We have to maintain the same number of points in order for morph targets to work. So I'm just going to take some of these. Let's take a row of polygons. I'm using the right mouse button to lasso that row. And I'm just going to size this out. Select modify and size. I'm going to go to the top view and size it out like that. And now I'm going to select move and move it down. By the way, a nice keyboard shortcut when you're moving these, if you want to make sure you move only along one axis, you can hold the control key down. And the first axis you start moving along, your items will be constrained to that. Notice I'm not moving along the x-axis at all if you look in the coordinates window in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Another way of doing that is by using the middle mouse button. And as soon as you start moving, that acts the same as if you're holding down the control key. You can still move off to the side, but it moves in bigger increments. OK, let's undo that and set it there. That'll be good. And we'll call this save as ball2.lwo. And finally, let's undo that and get back to where we started. And let's just take the whole bottom half of this ball and let's taper this out. And let's also stretch it. And I'm going to stretch from this area right here, stretch downwards. OK. That'll be good enough for our third object. Object, save as, ball number three. OK. All we did was modify these objects so they maintain the same number of points. That way they'll morph seamlessly. Let's get out of Modeler, go back into Lightwave, and let's load up these three objects. I'm going to click on Load Object, Load Ball 1, Ball 2, and Ball 3. Notice I was just double clicking on those to load. You can do that instead of clicking it once and selecting OK. All right, so our three objects are here. Now normally when you're setting up a morph, you decide what objects are going to morph into the other objects. For instance, ball 1 is my current object, and I want to set my metamorph target to ball 2. That means ball 1 will morph into ball 2. Let's go to ball 2, and ball 2 is going to morph into ball 3. This is how you set up multiple morphs. And then you would use envelopes between ball 1 and ball 2. You'd use a metamorph envelope to say, let's say, for instance, that we're going to create a key at frame 30. And at frame 30, I'm going to be 100% morphed into ball 2. OK? So it takes me 30 frames to go from ball 1 to ball 2. Let's use that envelope. And let's say then we wanted to go from ball 2 to ball 3. Now I would have to set up an envelope, a similar envelope, from ball 2 into ball 3. There's a hidden feature in Lightwave that allows you to do this with using only one envelope. Let's first of all clear this envelope. And what I did here is I held the shift key down and clicked on the envelope button. Instead of going in and actually hitting remove envelope, if you just hold shift and click on it, it will clear it. And that's true for textures and envelopes. OK, I still have my target set up, which is what I want, ball 1 into ball 2, ball 2 into ball 3. Also, in a, in a morph, you generally want to get rid of the other objects. For instance, let's just hide them off the camera view. I'm going to hit the Enter key and Enter again to create a key for it. Let's select Ball 3, move that as well. Now we can either move these out of the camera view or you can make them 100% dissolved in the Objects panel. Either way will work. OK. Now I've set them up. Now, in order to enable these hidden features in Lightwave, you have to hold the Control and Shift key down and hit F1 while you're in the main layout window. Notice here we get a requester up that says experimental features are enabled. Just hit continue there. Now we go into the objects panel. And let's go to ball one. 
and again hold control and shift down and this time hit F2 and you'll get a request up that says multiple target single envelope morphine is turned on for this object. Notice we selected ball one first because this is the main source object. Okay, multiple target single envelope, what that means is just what it says we're going to morph this object into multiple targets, into two, then into three, but we're only going to use one envelope to do that. So let's select the envelope for this one and the way MTSC morphine works is by assigning the values between 0 and 100 to the first source object into the first target object. In this case, ball 1 into ball 2. So let's create a key at frame 30, and let's set that value at frame 30 to 100. Okay, We're saying ball 1 goes in 30 frames into ball 2. Now we want to go from ball 2 into ball 3 during the next 30 frames. So let's create a key at frame 60. And at frame 60, let's set this envelope to 200. OK. Values between 0 and 100 are from ball 1 to ball 2. Values between 100 and 200% are from ball 2 to ball 3. If we had more objects in there, values from 200 to 300 would be the next target, and so on. So what we're doing, we've set up a 60-frame animation. Let's go back. Let's go to the scene panel and change our last frame to 60. Okay. Now, we'll just watch this from the camera point of view. Watch as I go through the frame slider. We go to frame 30. That's our second ball target. And now we go from 30 to 60, and we go from the second ball to the third ball. Let's just make a wireframe of this. 1 to 60. We morph to the first one, then we morph to the second one. And this is all done by using a single envelope. Much easier than the old style way of doing it with all the multiple envelopes. Especially when you have, say, 10 to 15, mul 10 to 15 morph targets in there. It's it very difficult. Lightwave allows you to morph up to 40 different targets. Okay, let's kill this preview. And I want to talk about one more tip that's really handy when you're morphing. And to do that, we need to go back into Modeler. And let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, let's just cut this out. Now, when you're morphing, all Lightwave really cares about is where the point positions are, unless you're using surface morphing. But if we're not using surface morphing, as in this case, we can do this tip. Let's just load up ball 2, which is the first target, hitting the A key to zoom in on that. And since Lightwave doesn't care about the polygons in the morph, unless we're using surface morphing again, we can kill all those and thus save some memory. So I'm going to hit the K key on the keyboard. That kills all the polygons. And now I can save this object, save as. And we'll just save over. We'll save it as ball 2. And let's go to another layer and do the same thing with ball 3. Load up ball 3. Hit K to kill the polygons. Hit save. We want to save it as ball 3. OK, let's go back out to Lightwave. And this time we're going to go to the objects panel. Lightwave still has in memory the old ball 2 and ball 3, so I'm just going to replace them with the new versions. Notice it says zero polygons in here. Ball 3 also, zero polygons. So what we've just done is we've lowered our polygon count dramatically here. And the same thing happens with the morph because the point information is still there. When you do this way, now you don't have to take these objects and hide them behind the camera like we did. We can leave them out in the middle because since they're only composed of points, they'll never render in your scene. So it doesn't matter where they are. Let's talk about a few more of the features in the objects panel. I'm going to first load an object that I have on my zip drive here. Go to Objects and Stars. This is an object called StarHalf.lwo. This is an object we use uh, all the time in Star Trek Voyager. And I'm just going to move the camera, going to s reset the camera so we're in the middle of the stars and create a key for it there. Now, in the Objects panel, we have down here Particle Line Size. We have four choices, Automatic, Small, Medium, or Large. And what these refer to are the size of these single particles that are composing the stars. 
So let's just render this out. Let's go to the record panel, make sure full size window is on. I'm just going to render this out by hitting the F9 key, which will render this current frame. Okay. And notice we have a bunch of different stars. By default, Lightwave's particle size is set to automatic. What this means, I'm hitting a mouse key to clear that. What this means is if you are in medium resolution, Lightwave will make a particle size of a 3x3 three three pixel array. And what that means is every particle is composed of like a single particle in the middle, and then you have a row of three polygons all around that. And those are slightly less in intensity, so it appears to be a round particle. Okay? If we set it to super low res, automatic, and render this out, the automatic thing is going to make very small stars. They're going to be set at one pixel. Let's clear that out. And if we set it to a resolution like high, what's going to happen is that the stars are going to be rendered with a 5 by 5 pixel array. This will draw down here, and you can see that the stars are much bigger. Well, because oftentimes you may not want to use automatic, for instance, you might be rendering in medium resolution, but the 3 by 3 pixel array is just a little too big. What you might want to do is go to the objects panel and set it to small. Okay, let's go back, camera, set this to medium res, render this out. F9. Okay, those stars are small. Notice it's just single pixels as opposed to the 3x3 three three pixel array. Hit that. And we can go back to objects and this time we'll just make them large. Hit F9. This gives us our 5x5 five five pixel array. Makes them very big. So it's very easy to adjust them. And what you might want to do is you might want to have a couple different star fields some of them are set to small, some are set to medium, etc. That way you're going to get some different size stars in your scene. Okay, the other thing that's in there that's involved with particle line size is when we're using lines. Now, just like small means a, one, a single pixel, if we're using lines, which are simply two polygons connect, I'm sorry, two points connected together into a polygon, if we set that to small, it's going to be one pixel wide. If we set it to medium, it's going to be three pixels wide. And if we set it to large, it's going to be five pixels wide. Now, whenever Lightwave renders particles or lines, it renders them the same thickness no matter how far away they are from the camera. So by using the, the particle line size values, we can adjust what those are going to be. Let's talk about another hidden feature in Lightwave, and that's cell look edges. Again, to enable experimental features, you hold the control and shift key down and hit F1 while in the main layout window. You'll get the message, experimental features enabled. And by, by the way, to disable this, you do the same thing, control, shift, F1, and now it will tell you it's disabled. So let's go back, enable it. And one other thing that happens when you do enable experimental features, when you go into the scene overview, notice we have a couple lines here. This green line represents your start frame. And the red line, which may be a little hard to see, but let's change our last frame to 35. Notice we have this red line right here, which represents our last frame. If you're seeing the green and the red lines, that means you have the experimental features enabled. Okay. Well, let's just load up a simple object. We'll load up the good old cow. And I'm just going to set up a quick little view of the cow here. We're going to rotate it around. Something like that. Let's just move it like so. Create a key for it. I'm going to go to the effects panel and change the background color to a lighter color. Kind of make it a light blue. Okay. Because I enabled the experimental features, we can go into the objects panel. And if I hold down Control, Shift, and hit F3, remember F2 is for the MTSC morphing, F3 will give me cell look edges turned on for this object. 
Notice as soon as I say OK, the Polygon Edges button is automatically enabled, and we have an edge color here. We'll just leave that set to black for now. And let's just go F9, render this out. And notice as the cow renders, when it draws down the final image, you'll see black outline around all of the outer extremities of the cow. Let me get a little bit better lighting on it so we can see it. And take the light and just rotate it around like so. Create a key for that. And also, this time I'm going to go back to the objects panel and change the particle line size. That determines how thick the cell look edges are. Because we're set at small, let's just bump that up to medium. Continue. F9 renders us out again. And this time, once the cow's done, you'll have a little bit better look at the edges. And of course, if we anti-alias this, these edges will be much smoother than they are now. So basically, it kind of gives you a, a semi-cartoon look. It looks as if it's drawn in an outline, and then it's filled in. OK, let's just go back to the Objects panel. To turn that off, we just do the same keyboard sequence, Control, Shift, F3. It tells you that cell look edges are turned off. OK, just a couple other things to talk about in the bottom of the Objects panel. And those are unseen by rays and unaffected by fog. These are both really useful when setting up, for instance, a front projection scene. Unseen by rays basically tells you, and let's just clear our scene, and let's load up a couple objects, and let's just load a ball and something to reflect that ball off of. We'll load this flat plane object. OK. Let's set this up so our ball is there. Create a key for it. From the top view, want to make sure it's in front. OK. The flat plane is good. Let's go to the surfaces for the plane is using the surface name default. I'm just going to turn double sided on because I'm not sure which way that surface normal of the plane is, and I want to make sure I see it. And I'm also going to make it reflective. We'll just make it you know, about 90% reflective. And in the reflection options, I want to make sure I ray trace and backdrop. That's fine. Let's go to the effects panel, make our backdrop a lighter color. OK. And the other thing surfaces for that, normally if you want a really good reflection, you want to turn your diffuse values down. So I'm going to drop that down to about 35%. OK. Go to the camera panel, turn on trace reflection in order to see that. And now let's hit F9. I'm also going to go to the camera panel. Let's bump our segment memory up so we only render in one segment. Move the camera over a little bit and rotate it like so. And while we're at it, let's give the ball a, a good surface because it's pretty plain. Let's make it somewhat blue. And we'll give it a fractal noise pattern. Let's just make the texture size 0.25. And uh, yeah, we'll use that. See what that looks like. We'll render a surface sample. OK, that's uh, good enough. Make it a little luminous so we can see it. All right. Again, hit F9 to render this out. OK, there we see the reflection in the plane. Looks like what we'd expect. All right, now if we clear that out, go to the Objects panel, and for the ball object, we want to say Unseen by Rays. What that will do is now when we render it, what happens is the reflection of the ball does not show up in the other object. We can still reflect objects in the ball if we wanted, if the ball had some degree of reflectivity. But what we're saying is this is unseen by any of the rays. Therefore, it won't show up in reflections. Okay. Now note that that doesn't change the shadow options. The shadow options are separate. So I could still decide that I'm not going to receive a shadow of this ball by simply turning those off. The ball wouldn't cast a shadow, receive it, or self-shadow. And finally, unaffected by fog does exactly what you think it would do. You may have a fog in here. Let's just use the same objects. Go to the top view. 
my grid here is two meters, so two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay, the reflection plane is about ten meters away from the camera. So if I go to the effects panel, turn on fog, and let's make the maximum fog distance ten meters. Now go to the options panel to turn on the fog radius. Okay, notice that the reflection plane falls just outside of that. Things like the fog radius, show safe areas, and other features in the options panel are saved as part of the scene file. So next time you load up the scene, they'll be on if you left them on. Okay, our fog radius is correct. Let's go to the effects panel and let's just decide to use backdrop fog. That's going to blend the objects into the background color. Back to our camera. Let's just render this out to see what it looks like. Okay, notice that everything is fading into fog and the plane is totally invisible because it falls outside of the fog area and I'm using the maximum fog of 100%. So it falls behind it. But let's say I wanted that plane to show up. Let's get out of this, go to the objects panel, flat plane, and let's say unaffected by fog, hit continue, render this out again. This time the plane is totally ignored in the fog value calculations and it shows up 100%. This is really useful when you're doing things like stars. You might have a huge star field out there, but you still might be using fog. Let's say you're looking on edge at a planet along the horizon. You might want to fade that off into fog to create an atmospheric effect. But the stars that fall outside of the fog area, you don't want those to be fading in the fog. Turning unaffected by fog for the stars will prevent that from happening. All right, let's talk about a few of the features in the surfaces panel. Before that, we need to jump into Modeler and create a quick object. In Modeler, I'm going to create a light cone by simply going to the objects panel and to disk and basically draw out a disk along the z-axis. Let's use the comma key to zoom out a little bit. A nice keyboard shortcut in Modeler is to hold down the alternate key and you can slide things around. You can slide the whole interface like that. Okay, draw that out. Let's make it uh, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten meters long. That's good. That'll work. Let's make it a little bit wider here. Now the nice thing about Modeler, when you go and do something interactively like this, if you then pop up the numeric panel by either hitting the numeric button or N on the keyboard, it will give you the values that you just put in. For instance, the center at Z Okay, is 5 meters. That's because I'm making this 10 meters long. So every, all these values are fine. 800 millimeters, that's fine. Uh, 16 sides, let's just make it a little more. Let's make it 24. All right, say OK. Hit Enter to create it. All right, now it's not quite a light cone yet. Basically, I want this side to be tapered down. So I'm going to select polygon there, hold the Shift key down, and lasso the polygon on the other end. I don't need these end polygons, don't need those caps, so I'm going to just hit K to kill those. Okay, now I want to taper this end down. To do that I can hit modify, taper, taper 1, which will do it equally. And since I'm going to be tapering the negative side, I want to go into numeric and make sure negative is selected for the sense. Say keep, and now go right into the center of it here and taper that down. Okay, why didn't I just use a cone instead of a disc for this? The problem is with a cone is that the end of it is a single point, which doesn't always shade properly when rendered in layout. By using a disc that's tapered at the end, you'll assure that it's shading properly. Okay, let's go back and just save this object out. Before we do, I'm going to hit the Q key on the keyboard and change this to light beam for the surface name and do a save as and let's just save this oh, let's go to the f new tech objects directory and let's just save this as lightbeam.lwo minimize modeler go back into layout let's load that object up lightbeam.lwo okay now what we're going to talk about in the surface panel is a way to achieve two different types of transparency by using the additive channel. So let's first of all, with the light beam, if we render this out just as it is, we would get basically 
this cylinder with a squared flat end. We want a light beam to kind of fall off and round off at the end. To do that, I'm going to use a transparency map as a fall off. So I'm going to go to the images panel, load up an image, and let's find that here. I have an image that's called jgfalloff.iff. And basically, if you look at it, it's darker here at the end, but as it goes out, it gets more and more white, which means it's more and more transparent. Notice the curve to it up here. What that's going to do is kind of curve off the end of the light beam. So we're going to apply this in the surfaces panel for transparency. Let's go here, and we're going to do a planar image map on the y-axis. We're going to project it down. All I need to do is an automatic sizing. Make sure we choose JG fall off. Okay, and because this image is going to be projected straight down, this is the end that's the tip of the cone, basically, and this is the end that's the flared end. Okay, now I'm going to also check the texture size. It's 10 long. I'm going to make it just a little bit longer than that to make sure that the fall off works properly. So let's just say 10.1. Okay, and let's just take a look at this light beam. Go to the camera panel objects and let's rotate it a bit and I'm going to also move the camera up and out like so okay let's create a key we'll create a key for all items here that'll lock the camera and the beam down and let's also uh, look at our surfaces we'll turn smoothing on um, let's give it a slightly bluish color Okay, everything else we'll just leave for now and we'll just take a look at how the transparency looks. Let's render this out by hitting F9. Make sure that full size window is selected, which it is. F9 renders it out. Draws in our light beam. Okay, and you can see what's kind of happening. Uh, one of the problems is we need to turn luminosity on in order because light beams are generally fairly luminous. Let's do, do a little surface sample on that. Okay. Notice my surface sample is looking a little strange because I have this fall off brush. Okay, so let's just try rendering this out. Okay, that works a little bit better. But notice the problem here is that we have this solid object. Okay, generally what you will want for a light beam is let's make it double sided. Um, let's now we'll leave it slightly blue. Let's make it a little bit brighter. Okay. Now chances are we're going to add a little bit of fractal noise to this. So all we have to do is let's go into the surface panel and let's make this fractal noise. The value I was using was blue, so we'll come out a little bit around that. Okay. And let's also make the size... Uh, 0.5 for all values. Okay, render this out again. This should look a little closer to what our light beam. Normally we'd use some degree of transparency, but remember we're using the transparency falloff map to get the beam to fade off at the very end of it. So how can we add some transparency in here because we're already using the transparency channel? That's where additive comes in. If we go to the surfaces panel, select additive for this object, what additive does is it adds the color of the surface to the colors behind the object. Because in this case, our background is black, it's going to add the surface color to the black. And in this case, the surface color, let's say it's 200, 200, 200. 200, 200, 200 plus 000, 000, 000 black is 200, 200, 200. But what if we change the surface values now? Let's give some diffuse values to it. And let's just, again, use fractal noise. Texture size of point, uh, point 0.25 for all values. Okay, But the texture value is going to be 0. Where the diffuse is 0, the object will go towards black. Okay, Now we're going to have a little problem with that because we have luminosity in there. So what we might actually do is use the same fractal pattern in that luminosity channel. So we can remember what that is. Fractal noise. Texture size is 0.25 for all three. 
and let's go to zero here as well. Okay, let's try rendering this out, see what we have. We might have to adjust our values. Oh, that's working fairly well. This would be as if we were moving the light beam through a cloudy or smoky room. Notice we're getting some more transparency levels in there, and that's because we're using additive. Here it's very solid at the base where we would expect it to be, and probably we'd put a lens flare down here to represent the actual light. But notice up here it's kind of getting, it's fading off to transparency because of the map, but also we have these transparency values throughout it. And if we go and we change the background colors, you'll notice the same thing works. Let's just make the background kind of a bluish color. F9 to render that out. We get the same exact effect. It's just that where the surface becomes black, that's added to the background. So the surface value of black, zero, zero, zero. And those are the areas where the luminosity is zero and the diffuse level is zero in the fractal pattern. That zero, zero, zero is added to the background colors, which are, in this case, blue. And that means the surface color of the object equals blue. If we had another object placed behind this, let's just load up a simple object here. We'll load up this ball object. Okay. And let's take this and move it. So we're located behind. Let's make sure we're behind here. We'll size it out a bit so we can see it. Move it like so. Create a key for it there. Check it from the camera view. All right. Render this out. Notice what's happening here. Because the light beam is additive, anything behind it, not just the background, is being added to it, which gives us this second level of transparency. So additive is really useful when you're doing things like light beams, rocket flares, etc. It helps to give you an extra level of transparency without using up your transparency channel. Next I want to talk about smoothing angle found within the surfaces panel. But before we do that, let's go into Modeler to create an object to help us demonstrate. Okay, let's start off by making a simple box. Just going to draw this out. Hit Enter to make it. Let's go to another layer here. Put the box in the background layer. This time we're going to make a disk. And let's just make a disk that cuts through the box like so. And also let's go to Modify and Rotate that disk. We'll rotate it from here. Kind of put it at an angle where it's going to cut through the box, like so. Okay, that'll work. Now let's swap layers. I want the disk in the background layer. So I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut, which is the quote key next to the enter key. That swaps the two layers, swaps your foreground and background layers. And now we're going to do a Boolean cut. Actually, let's swap the layers back. And let's rotate this a little more, put it at maybe an angle like so. And actually, let's stretch it out. So we're getting kind of a weird shape here is what I'm trying to achieve that's going to cut through the box. OK, that'll work. Swap layers. Let's go to the Tools menu, and we can hit Boolean. Subtract is already selected, so let's subtract that out. OK, I'm going to hit the D button to bring up the display options. Select Solid. OK, that's what our object looks like. Let's just do another Boolean cut in it. Let's go to another layer, put the box in the background, make a ball this time. And let's uh, cut off this end of the ball, something like so. Again, let's swap layers. There we are. And do a Boolean again. Shift B is the Boolean shortcut. OK. All right, so there's my object. We have a couple different cuts in it. Everything's looking fine. Let's save this out. Before we do that, let's merge all the points. Now, you don't always merge points after doing Booleans, but you may have, and it depends on how you've built your object. So let's say we've merged our points. Let's also name these surfaces. We'll just call them box. Apply that. And let's save this out, and we're just going to use the name tunnelbox.lwo. Okay, let's minimize that. Go back into layout. 
objects, load object, tunnel box. Okay, let's get a little different camera angle on this. Uh, actually, that's not bad. Let's just rotate the, the box a bit, like so, so we can see all the different angles. Okay, let's create a key, like so. All right, let's go to the background. Backdrop color, let's just make this kind of light so it's easy to see through. And let's go to surfaces for the box surface, and let's just make that kind of a yellowish color by dragging the blue out. I'm also going to rotate the light a little bit so we can get more angle on the front of it. Create a key for the light. Surfaces, let's turn smoothing on. Continue. Let's render this out again. And you'll notice what happens when we try to smooth is that we're running into smoothing errors right along this line and this line here. This object is not smoothing properly. And the reason for that is because of the angle that this was cut out at. And because we merged the points, these edge points all along here are shared between the flat face on the front of the box and the angled tunnel along the sides. Also along here, these points right along that edge are shared between the curved inner part here and the flat face of the box. A way around this, let's clear that out, go into the surfaces panel. A way around this is by playing with the maximum smoothing angle. Okay, What maximum smoothing angle means is if you have two polygons that are butting up next to each other, like the corners of a box, and imagine those, the surface normals of those polygons pointing out, now project those normals back into where they intersect. Okay? At that point, if it was the edge of a box, those normals would intersect at a 90 degree angle. With my smoothing angle set to 89.5 degrees, that means any angles greater than 89.5 are not going to be smoothed. It only smooths up to a maximum of 89.5 degrees. What that means is we're going to have sharp cornered edges on that box. If I were to adjust the smoothing angle up to, say, 95 degrees on the box, because that is greater than my 90 degree angle, it's going to try to smooth across the corners of the box, which isn't accurate. That's why the smoothing angle defaults to 89.5. But what happens in this case, let's render this back out so we can see what we're looking at. Set our smoothing angle back to 89.5, the default, and hit F9. What happens in this case is that because the angle of the tunnel through the box intersects at the edge of the box in less than 89 and a half degrees, okay, remember project those surface normals back, the inside of the tunnel goes like this, the box face goes like this, this angle here is less than 89.5, Lightwave tries to smooth that. And in this case, it's erroneous. So let's get out of here, and all we have to do to take care of this is adjust the smoothing angle down. Let's try an angle of, say, 45 degrees. Render this out. And sometimes this is a little bit trial and error. Okay? For instance, everything up here looks pretty good, but notice this line right here. Okay? That's a problem. So we're going to lower the smoothing angle even further. Let's try 30 degrees. Render this out. Okay, that's taken care of it. But you'll notice in here everything in the tunnel looks fine, the front face looks fine, but notice what's happening in here. These polygons are more than 30 degrees, and what's happening is it's not smoothing because the smoothing angle is only set to a maximum of 30 degrees in this case. So you can see it's a little trial and error. We might have to go up to 35 or so to cover the whole thing. Okay, so that's maximum smoothing angle, and that's really useful when you've done things like Boolean cuts and you're getting these little puckers around the edges where you've cut. Try lowering the maximum smoothing angle to take care of that. The feature we're going to talk about is also found in the surface panel, and it's called Shadow Alpha. Basically what Shadow Alpha does is it allows you to cast a shadow on a background image. Let's see how it works. First of all, let's take a look at the image that we're going to use. I have an image called Castle Background, and I'm just going to put that, go to the effects panel, put that in the background image, and render it out so you can see what it looks like. 
Okay. Basically, it's just a picture of a castle. Now, let's say that we have a flying object like a spaceship, and it's going to fly past the camera and around the castle peak and then back out. And we would want to obviously cast a shadow of the spaceship onto the castle peak as it passes. Well, because this is an image, it's kind of hard to do, but with shadow alpha, we can do it pretty easily. Let's go back out here. And what we have to do is go into Modeler to first build our Castle Peak object. Before we do that, let's take a look at what our frame aspect that we're using. Since we're using square pixels to render this out, I'm using a frame aspect of 1.333. Okay, keep that in mind because that will be important when we get into Modeler. Let's load up the image here. We can go to the Display menu, Background Image, and select Load. And I'm going to find my castle background image. Okay. Now, Modeler doesn't know what size to make an image when you load it in. So you have to use the frame aspect that we saw in Lightwave, the 1.333, as our image size. So when we build our object using the image as a template, the object is built to the correct proportions. So let's just change that. We're going to project the castle background image on the Z axis. And we're going to make the size along the X 1.333. We can leave the Y to 1 and just say OK. And let's just go down to this and zoom in a bit. And as it draws the image down, you can see a dithered representation of our castle background. OK, this will work pretty good. What we're going to do is we're going to put our cursor right over the castle peak, hit the G key. That stands for go to center. That's going to put that area in the center. And I'm going to use the period key to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in a few times to get the castle peak centered up in the frame. We'll just wait for the image to redraw here. OK, there we see our castle peak. So now what I'm going to do is make an object that is the basic shape of the castle peak in order to cast a shadow upon. So I'm just going to go to the polygon menu create points, <clears throat> and I'm just going to basically add some points where I think they should be along the edge. And I'm using the right mouse button to add these points, which automatically creates them when I let go. Another little tip there. There looks like there's a little jut out there. Come down here. Go out to here, down a bit, in. I'm just going to end it at that point. And now I'm going to go back to the first one. And notice what I'm trying to do is get the cursor, the crosshairs, to line up with the first point that's right here and this last point I created right here, which puts it right at that point. OK. Click in the blank area. Now I'm going to hit the P key to make a polygon out of those points. And basically what I've done is made a silhouette of the castle. Now I need to go to another layer, hit Multiply, Lathe, and put the cursor right at that point. And if I want to know exactly where that is, I can go to the point selection mode, select that point, which really selects two points, because Mahler doesn't know which one I mean. That's OK. Hit the I to bring up the info requester. And it tells me that it's located at negative 120 millimeters on the x-axis. OK, so that's what I need to know. I'm going to go back to the lathe requester, line this up. And to make sure that's right there, I can now hit numeric and make sure it's negative 120 millimeters on the X. That's fine. I want to lathe around the Y. And I want to give this a few more sides to make it a little bit smoother. So I'm going to make it, let's say, 24. OK. And hit the Enter key. Oh, before I do that, notice I, I have the point selected. I want to go back to polygon selection mode, set up the lathe again. Now, because I've already set the lathe up once, I can just hit lathe, numeric, and then say OK, and it remembers all those settings that I put in earlier. OK, it's ready to go. Hit return. That's going to lathe it around. OK, that fits it pretty well, and for purposes of this demonstration, this will be fine. So let's just save this object out. Let's change the surface with the Q key. Make it castle peak. OK. And go to Objects, Save As, and let's save this as castlepeak.lwo. OK, let's get out of Modeler into Layout. 
Now that image is already loaded, so what we can do is go to the effects panel. It's already in the background. So then we go to options and select background image. That's going to put it in the background when we're in the camera point of view. So we go to camera, notice the cursor goes busy and it draws in the image. Okay, now basically what I need to do is, if I was setting this up for real, I would know the distance from the camera to the castle when this plate was originally shot. Since I don't really know that, I'm just going to guess and put the castle peak out a distance so I can fly my spaceship around it and, and everything works. All right, well, let's load up our object, Castle Peak. Now, chances are I probably would have wanted to have built this Castle Peak to scale, so when I did place it, let's say it was 200 meters from the camera, or, you know, half a kilometer, whatever, when I did place it that way, because I had built it to scale, it would closely match what we have here. But for now, for purposes of explanation, this is going to work just fine. I'm going to try to get this Castle Peak into position so it basically covers the background image. Okay, that's pretty good right there. Let's call that good. Let's create a key for it. When we go to the top view to see how far away it is, okay, that'll work for this purpose. Okay, now I need to add the object that's going to cast the shadow, and we're going to use the spaceship. So go to Objects, Load Object, and let's find the space directory. And we'll just use the simple spaceship object. Even though it's primitive, it'll work fine for purposes of demonstration. Okay, now I know that because I didn't build a castle peak to scale, the spaceship object is huge compared, or actually the castle peak object is tiny compared to the spaceship object. So let's just size our spaceship down. And I'm going to choose size, numeric, and let's try like 0.006. Might have to adjust this, but now let's move it. Get it close to the peak. I'm going to hit center to center the display on the spaceship, zoom in. Okay, uh, that actually works pretty well. Um, now we want to move it up a bit. Notice right now how big my grid is. My grid is set to 5.0, but the castle peak is tiny. And so when I actually move the spaceship, it's probably going to zip off the screen. Okay, well, it's not moving too bad. What we can do is use the bracket keys to just make our grid smaller so the objects move in smaller increments. Objects will always move at one one hundredth of your grid size. So when you're moving them, if you have a very large object loaded and a very small object, and the grid is set to accommodate the larger object, moving the small object will just zip it off the screen because it's snapping to one one hundredth of a huge grid. So just lower the grid size and everything will work. Okay, so there's my spaceship. I'm actually going to size it up just a hair, like so. Okay, let's create a key for it right there. Now let's say we've, we're going to set up this animation where this ship comes over the camera, flies around the castle peak, and, and goes back out. What we want to do is, at some point, the light, which I'm going to put a light here kind of aimed at the castle peak, the light will cast a shadow of the ship onto the peak. So, let's just kind of get it in angle. Let's maybe rotate it like that. I'm going to put it uh, about here, create a key. Now what we need to do is set up a light source, and I'm going to move the light and look through the light view. Let's first of all set the light up so it's like so. I'm going to look through the light view so I know that the light is going to cast a shadow on the peak. So I'm just going to rotate it up, maybe move the light down a bit. Okay, right there, because I'm looking from the light point of view, I know that the ship's going to cast a shadow. So let's create a key for the light at that point. Okay, let's just save the scene just in case we need to come back to it later. It's always a good idea to save your scenes. Let's just call it sa.lws. Okay, now here's the whole point behind Shadow Alpha. We don't actually have a real castle there, so we have to fake it by casting a shadow onto that object that we built to kind of represent the castle. What we need to do is go to the surfaces panel for the castle peak object, and we need to make the color of the castle the color we want the shadow to be. In this case, we want it black. Okay, so slide those values down to black. Okay, we have to have some diffuse level on it because if an object has no diffuse, it won't receive any shadows. So let's leave the diffuse at 100. Okay. 
But now let's turn on shadow alpha. And that's all we need to do. Let's turn smoothing on also. Okay, so this is basically, if we render this out, it's just going to render a solid black. We're not even going to see a shadow that's cast on that. But we will when we combine images later. All right, so that's the object. Let's just save that in case we need to come back to it. Castle Peak, save object. Okay. All right. Now we've set up our light source. It's aimed at the spaceship, which is casting a shadow on the shadow peak. We need to go to the camera panel and make sure trace shadows is selected. We need to go to the lights panel and make sure that that light has ray trace on, which it does. Okay. Now here's the whole secret. What we need to do is simply go into the record panel and we want to save RGB image. And I'm going to save all these to a directory called images out. The RGB I'm going to just save as RGB. Okay. We need to save an alpha image. I'm going to save the alpha image to the same directory as alpha. Okay. And now we want to make sure that we have the shadow alpha set only for the castle peak. Everything else does not have it. And I'm using the down arrows to scroll through to make sure. Okay. The final thing we have to do before we render this is go to the effects panel and take off the background image. We want to render this against black. And that will become evident why we're doing that as soon as we composite this back together. Okay, we're saving out our images. Record is set up. Let's go here. Go to the render panel. And we'll just save this first image. Save that. Let's render this out. We'll let it draw our full size window so we see that as well. Okay. Notice all we see in the RGB image is the spaceship. There's no castle peak in there because it's black. Okay. They're rendered out. Let's abort that. Now to put it all back together, what we need to do is simply go to the scene panel. Let's clear this scene. Now we need to load up the respective images. Go to images, load image, and let's load the castle background because we're going to composite everything on top of this. Load another image and that's located in the F directory in the images out directory and we're looking for one called RGB. Okay, Lightwave defaults is showing you IFF and target file so I need to set file types to all. There's my RGB file. Okay. Notice, maybe hard to see, but you see the little RGB of the spaceship. Let's load the alpha image called alpha 001, the spaceship. Okay, now notice what's a little bit different. I'm just going to put the alpha image into the background just so we can load it up and see what it looks like real quick here. F9 it out. Notice what's happening here. We have the spaceship alpha, which is solid white because the spaceship is solid. Then we have something happening on the castle peak. And this is an alpha of the shadow. Because we turned shadow alpha on that for that object, the castle peak itself does not show up in the alpha channel, which would be a solid white castle peak. But the shadow that falls on it does show up in the alpha channel. This is important because when we composite this back together, let's go back to the image compositing panel, our background is castle background. Our foreground image is the RGB. And the foreground alpha image is the alpha. Let's render this all out and see what we have. It loads the background, renders that. Now it's going to put in the spaceship. And lo and behold, if you look carefully here, we'll wait for the full-size window to draw, you'll see that we have the shadow of the spaceship falling on the castle peak. But notice the, the actual castle peak object is not showing up because we render that with shadow alpha. So this is a really effective technique for casting shadows on things that don't really exist. All you have to do is build a basically a stand-in object that represents the, the geometry of what's in the background image, place it so it covers the background image, turn the shadow alpha on for it, render it out, composite your images back together like we just did, and you'll get shadows cast onto your background. Next, I want to talk about a few nice features found in the Images panel. 
One of the best things about LightWave is it allows you to use image sequences, which is great for mapping moving video, for instance, onto televisions or explosion sequences onto explosion spheres that appear in your scenes when things blow up. So what we're going to do is load up a sequence, and I'm just going to go to my PVR disk and load up one called JG Logo, which is basically the New Tech World Premiere logo with John Grill substituted in instead. And with LightWave, all you have to do is select one of the images in the sequence. You don't have to delete anything out here. Just say OK. And LightWave is automatically going to determine the number of sequence digits and the extension, if any. And notice that the sequence here is called JGLO, OK? Because when I loaded that up, that's what I named it, JGLO 001, 0002, et cetera. OK. So it finds that. That's my sequence name. It automatically tells me the number of digits and everything. Now, that's the sequence I'm going to use. And let's just see how many frames are in here, just out of curiosity's sake. Okay, there's 150. All right. Now, let's say we want to have multiple objects in the same scene that use that sequence. Normally, how you'd have to do this is save your object with the sequence on it, and then save another object with the sequence, but name something differently. The sequence would have to be named something differently, so it could use different offsets. For instance, let's say you have a wall of video monitors, but you want the same sequence to be offset 10 frames on every monitor. Basically, what you'd have to do is create the same sequence 10 different times using a different name, because LightWave is going to try to use that same sequence for all objects. It's going to try to use the same offset, if you will, for all objects. Okay, this will become a little bit more apparent as soon as I load up a couple objects here. Let's first of all load an object, and we're just going to use a flat plane, if I can find one here. Uh, let's use the 133 plane. Okay, this is just a flat plane, and what we can do is go to the surfaces panel for that plane. It uses the name default for the surface, and we can map as a planar image map, the JG logo sequence on there, I'm going to choose automatic sizing. I want to map it on the Z axis. Okay. So now if I come out here and let's go to frame 24, hit F9, it's going to load frame 24 of the image sequence onto that plane and map it, like so. Okay. Let's get out of that. Just to make things easier, see, I'm going to change the background to a lighter color. OK. So this is, let's say this is our first television monitor. We're going to put it up here, create a key at frame 0 for it. And now what happens when I render out frame 100, for instance, it's going to look for frame 100 of the image sequence and map that on. That is, unless I'm using a frame offset. Frame offset is simply added to the frame number you're rendering to determine which image of the sequence is used. For instance, if I have a frame offset of 50, and I go and I render frame 25, it will take the offset of 50, add that to 25, that gives us 75. And so for this image, it's going to use image 75 of the sequence. Okay? Well, so let's say we had a number of different monitors and everyone's off 10 frames. So the first one has no frame offset. The next one has a frame offset of 10. The next one a frame offset of 20. Next one a frame offset of 30. Okay. The problem is, is because I'm using the same surface name and I'm using the same image sequence, it's going to go through and it's going to use the exact same offset of all the objects. Let me demonstrate. I'm going to save this object. It uses a frame offset of the image, okay. Frame offset, by the way, is saved as part of the object file, not part of the image file. So here's where we run into the problem. Let's give that a frame offset of zero. Let's save that object out and say okay to that. Okay. Now, let's just say we're going to load up that same object again. Okay. 133 plane. The second one I'm going to move off here put up in this corner, like so, create a key at frame 0. Okay, that uses the same image sequence, okay, and it uses the same offset. 
Well, I want to give this second one an offset of 10 frames. So let's go there, type in 10. Okay. You, you can imagine what our problem is. This one's using an offset of 10. Let's go back to images. There's only one sequence there. It's only using the frame offset of this last object. Okay. I need to offset them all but use the same sequence. Okay. Well, if I save this object out, object, let's save this. Okay, we're going to call this 133 plane 2. Okay, so that uses an offset of 10. The first one used an offset of 0, but I've lost that because I'm using the same sequence. Here's how we get around that. First of all, let's clear this object out. I'm going to hit the minus key, clear the object from the scene, hit enter to say yes. I'm going to go back to this one, and we're going to change JGLO. Okay, we're fine there. Let's go to surfaces and change the name of this surface, rename it to plane number one. Okay. Object. Remember it uses just this one sequence, it's the only one we have loaded. And uh, let's set this offset at zero. Okay, go to objects, going to save this object. And this is going to be 133 plane one, number one. Okay, now let's do this. Let's load up the second object, load object. We're going to load the 133 plane again, which is the original object. Go to that. Let's just move it into position. Like so. Create a key at frame zero. Okay, let's go to the surface for that. We have plane number one. Default, let's change this one to plane number two. The key here is to keep all the surface names separate. Okay, plane number two is for object number two. Let's go to images. We want to use this exact same sequence, but we can't change the offset here because that would change it for the first object. So what we do is we load this sequence again, but we do it with a little trick. We say load sequence, we go here, but instead of JGLO all in capital letters as it's named, let's just change this all to lowercase, JGLO. Select OK. OK, notice we have a sequence name of JGLO lowercase. Here we have one uppercase. They're the exact same sequence, but because Lightwave is case sensitive, it's going to treat it as two separate, surf two separate sequences. So this one, let's take the offset, change it to 10. Actually, let's make it more. Let's make it offset of 25. Okay. Now we go to the surfaces for plane number two, texture panel. Let's select JGLO lowercase, auto size, use texture. Go to the objects panel and save this as 133 plane number two. Okay. Just keep repeating the process. We'll do it one more time. Objects, load object. Let's load the original plane. Let's just set it into place. We'll put it right down here. Create a key at frame zero for it. Surfaces panel. Go to default, which is the new one. Change it to plane number three. Okay. Go to the images panel. Load sequence, select the exact same sequence, this time change the name again by varying the upper and lower case. So let's make it a capital J, little g, capital L, little o. Doesn't matter how, what we do. Okay. This time give this one a frame offset of 50. Continue. Back to surfaces, plane number three, into the texture panel. Change this to JG, capital J, capital L. Auto size it, it's on the Z, use texture, okay. I have glow effect on for this plane, it's just because when I first loaded it that was on, so let's turn that off for all of them. Objects, to the third one, let's save this object as 133 plane number three, hit okay. And now I'm just going to do a save all objects to save the fact that I turned glow off for the other two, okay. So as far as LightWave is concerned, I'm going to load three separate sequences. 
One has JGLO, one has lowercase JGLO, one has a mixture. Everything set, our objects are three separate objects. Let's render out frame 50. And if everything went according to plan, okay, notice what happened there, how it started rendering and flipped out. It's because I go to the scene panel, my last frame is set to 30. I have to make sure that's at least equal to the frame I'm trying to render. Let's just set it to 100. Okay. This time, F9, that'll render it out. Notice what it said. It was looking for the separate images, and it's finding all the separate images. Even though it's using the exact same sequence, Lightwave thinks it's three different. Okay. All right, well, we're at three separate locations in the logo. It's a little hard to see because the logo is in, part in place, but notice the light beams are in different angles. So that's telling us we are actually using three separate images here. And what's happened is because we're doing it this way, we're saving space on our hard disk because we're using the exact same sequence, but Lightwave thinks it's multiple. This is really handy when you're doing things like explosions. You might want the same exact explosion sequence, but you might have a ship that blows up in three different areas that are offset by 10 or 20 frames apiece. So it might go boom, 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 something like that. You want to use the same explosion but offset it. This is the way to do it. Next, we're going to go into the lights panel and talk about some of the features there. First of all, let's say we're going to add a bunch of lens flares. I'm going to take the light that we have now, let's just make it a point light. Lens flare, lens flare options. And let's just make it an intensity of, uh, we'll say about 75%. Um, let's uh, put on a couple options, central glow. Uh, that's good enough. Let's leave that. Let's take this and let's take this light from the camera point of view. Let's just move this out here, create a key for it at frame zero. Going to render this out by hitting F9. See what it looks like. Okay. That'll work. Okay. So there's my flare. Now let's say we have a lot of these. So I'm just going to go through lights panel and I'm going to clone this. Oh, let's say uh, 20 times. Okay. That gives me. 21 lights. By the way, you can have up to 1,000 lights in the light wave scene. And let's just go through and move some of these about. Um, we'll just go down the list by using the left, and I'm going to kind of fly through the keyboard shortcuts here. I'm going to use the down arrow key to just select the next light, and then I'm going to have move selected and just move a light off and hit enter, and then enter again to create a key. And we'll just keep doing that for a number of different lights. And what we'll do before I keep going further, I'll go to the scene panel and go to the show all lights function. By default, lights are invisible from the views. And now, when we update this by sliding the frame slider, we should see all the lights. So we'll just keep going down, move these around. And all I'm doing is going through, setting them up in a number of different places. Okay, 15 is probably enough, so I'm just going to kill the rest of them. And what I'm doing is down arrow, hit minus, and then when it says if I want to clear it, I hit enter. And we'll just do that for the rest of these guys here. Okay. So, I have a total of yeah, 17 lights, it's good enough. 16 and 17 are in the same place. I'll kill 17. 15, okay. I have 16 lights. Let's just render this out, see what that looks like. Now, when you have a lot of lens flares, what happens is, uh, especially when they're piled on top of each other, lens flares are additive effects. So light wave will add all the flares together, and if they are on top of each other and you're sighting along the camera and you see a bunch of flares, they keep adding and getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Now, because we've separated these out, it's not so much a problem in this scene, but still the fact that we have a number of lens flares in there is going to cause uh, maybe perhaps too, too much brightness. The lens flares might be too bright which is happening here as it's rendering out, you're seeing that 
these hot spots are fairly hot. Now, because we have a number of lens flares in here, it would be a pain to go through and lower the intensities on each one of those. But what we can do is go back to the lights panel. We have a global flare intensity envelope up here. This isn't used very much, but this was added for Sequest in order to bring down all the lights together at one time. Some Sequest scenes would have up to a thousand lights in them, and you can imagine the pain to have to, to adjust those. So all it is is an envelope, and it's just a multiplier. Um, I can do it over time, or I can do it all at once, which I'm going to do here by just grabbing it with the left mouse and dragging it down to 20%. So what that's saying is it's going to take that value and multiply it times the lens flare intensity. So we're going to get 20% of whatever the intensity is. Let's render this out again. And as you see, as they start drawing, the lens flares are much smaller here. It's globally brought the flares down on all of these. And notice that we're more at little dots here. Global flare intensity has the added benefit of also lowering the light intensity if there's a flare associated with that light. For instance, because all of these lights have flares associated with them, because I've set the global flare intensity to 20%, what's going to happen is I'm going to diminish the light intensity as well. That's going to come down. If this light didn't have a lens flare, this value would not be affected by my global flare intensity value. So if you do need to bring down the brightness of all your lights, the intensity of them, but let's say they don't necessarily have a flare and you want to bring them all down together, a way around that is to go into the lens flare panel, assign a flare intensity of zero to the light, so there will be no flare, but there's still a lens flare associated with it. That way, when you adjust all the lights with the global flare intensity, because this light now has a lens flare, even though there's no real flare, it's going to bring the intensity down with the global flare envelope. This is a good way of, let's say you have 20 lights in a scene that are all lighting different parts. You might want to ramp everything down like you're dimming all the lights. Global flare intensity will allow you to do that. A couple other features in here. And by the way, the ambient intensity is by default set to 25%. I and many other people feel this is a little high. The reason it's this high is so you can just load up an object and render it, and no matter what, you're going to be able to see something because this light value is set pretty high, the ambient intensity. When I first start lighting a scene, I generally bring this down to anywhere between 0 and 5%, just to get a little touch of ambient in there, but not enough where it's going to wash everything out. This way, you really have to light your scene properly in order to get the proper lighting in there. It's, it, it gives you a much better effect than using a high ambient as well because your objects appear much less washed out. A couple other things here in the, in the lights panel. In the lens flare section, we have the ability to use glow behind objects. And this is something that confuses a lot of people, so I want to cover this. First of all, let's go and clear out all the lights in this scene, and we'll start with just one light. Okay. Notice when we clear lights, the lights panel gets set. The ambient intensity goes at back up to 25. You end up with one single light, okay, which is fine. Let's add a couple of objects here. I'm just going to load up the ever-present cow object. And let's just rotate that guy around, move him back a little bit, kind of give us more a uh, three-quarter angle. Okay, that's good. All right, let's take our light, and I'm going to take this light and set it up so it's right smack in the middle of the cow. Actually, let's, let's leave this light to light the scene. Let's light it, something like that, create a key for it there. I'm going to go and add another light. This light, I'll make a point light. I'm going to rename this one to flare so I know which light it is. And this one, we're going to put in the cow. Whoops. Let's go to lights, move, and stick it right in the middle of the cow, like so. And let's put it a little bit below so we see the flare, so it's not actually inside. Okay, that should work. Now, I'm going to go back to the lights panel. To the flare light, we don't need any intensity on this. All we want to do is have this a flare. I'm going to select lens flare, lens flare options, and we're going to select glow behind. When you do this, you get a requester up saying, this should only be used when simulating glows at a distance. And I'll show you why this requester comes up. Let's say OK. Now, glow behind objects was added to the lens flare options as a request of the Sequest crew. 
what we needed to do was we needed to have ships underwater backlit by light. And so we wanted to put flares behind them, but get the flare to appear as kind of a halo behind these ships. And that way we could silhouette ships against things. So this option was added, and let me show you what it does. First of all, to show you how it's supposed to be used, let's move it behind the cow, like so. Create a key. All right, it's behind the cow. Let's make the intensity fairly large so it comes out. Let's make it 200%. Hit F9 to render. Okay. What's happening here is the lens flare is behind the cow, yet it's appearing, we see the halo effect behind the cow. This is exactly what we wanted to do with it. Okay, that works pretty well. Let's get rid of that. But now, let's take that and simply move the flare down below. And now I'm going to also move it forward so it's located below the cow, like so. Create a key. And let's go back to the lights panel. Now it's going to be way too bright because we're going to see it. So let's just make it about, uh, let's make it 100%. Go out here. Render this flare out. Now the way lens, glow behind lens flares work is that they appear as if they're mapped onto a plane that is always facing the camera. So as the camera moves, that lens flare, that glow behind lens flare, is as if it's on a plane that's always perpendicular to the line of sight of the camera. It may be a little hard to see here, but what's happening is this flare, and we can see it up here, if you look carefully, the, the plane, so to say, of the glow behind flare is cutting through the cow. And you can see that right here. Let's just crank it up a little bit more to, to make the effect more obvious. Let's make it, uh, we'll go back to 200. Well, it's probably going to be a little hot down below. At least it'll wash out the back end of the cow. Okay, there you can see how the flare is actually cutting through the cow object. Okay, that's not good. That's just the way Lightwave does it, and it's the way lens, that's the way glow behind flares have to work. So that's why it gives you an error message saying, make sure that you put the flare back behind objects. As long as the flare is behind it, that plane of the flare, so to say, will always be behind the cow. Unless I move the camera around here, so it's looking at the side of the cow, then this plane would be perpendicular to the line of sight of the camera, and here it would be cutting through the cow. So you want to make sure it's behind the object from the camera's point of view. Okay, here's another problem that you can run into with this type of flare. Let's put it back behind the cow, create a key for it. And this time, let's go to the objects panel. And let's say you're trying to save a little bit of memory and you're, you're doing the right thing in adjusting your shadow options. Let's say, for instance, you don't need the cow to cast a shadow on other objects. So therefore, you might turn cast shadow off. Well, let's also say that we're using a lens flare that has fade behind objects on. We'll turn glow behind off for now. Fade behind objects will dim out a lens flare as it goes behind an object. So you might have a lens flare that's traveling along behind. You might have a logo. When the lens flare is shown, as soon as it ducks behind, it will fade out, which is what would happen. Okay. Well, let's render this out. Because we turn cast shadow off for the cow, as soon as the lens flare starts drawing, you're going to see that it's appearing behind the cow. Lens flares use the cast shadow option of the objects to determine whether the lens flare is behind the object or not. So if you're using fade behind on the lens flares, you have to cast shadow on the object. By default, cast shadow is on, so if you don't change it, you'll be fine. Okay, this notice what's happening here. The lens flare is behind it. And so it's not going to pop through, and, it's, and we're not going to see the flare either because we turned glow behind off. Let me show you one additional problem that you can run into when using glow behind lens flares. Let's say, for instance, our glow behind flare is in front of a solid object, such as the cow. And I'm going to load up another object to make transparent. And we'll just load, uh, let's see, the cylinder object will work. Okay. And we're going to take that cylinder object and move it in front of the flare, I'm going to rotate it out. OK. 
Okay, and let's just also shrink it down so it fits our scene a little better. Move it up here. Like so. I'm going to create a key for it there. Okay, now here's our cylinder object. Our light is right there. The cow is there. The cylinder I'm also going to make semi-transparent, so let's find that's using the surface name default. So let's take this and let's just make it 96% transparent. Okay. So let's see what that looks like. We'll turn on background pattern in the surface and we render that out. We can hardly see it. Okay. Turn on smoothing. That's fine. Now, because we have a light that is located behind a transparent object but in front of a solid object, and the light is using glow behind objects, let's see what happens when we render this out. Okay, it renders the cow. My background is lighter color to see what's happening. Okay, now you can see what's happening here. See this part against the cow? This is the cylinder where it's in front of the solid object, in this case the cow, the, the cylinder is drawing solid. We can see the edges. Notice everywhere else it's transparent. That's because we have the light behind the transparent object but in front of a solid one. If I take this glow behind and move it so it's behind the very last item in the scene so there's no solid objects in front of it, when I hit F9 to render this out, you'll see that everything renders properly. Okay, we have the glow behind the cow. We, can, we can't even see the cylinder because it's so transparent and everything renders the way it should. This is really important when you have, say, light beams, for instance, moving around and they happen to pass in front of a glow behind that is also in front of a solid object. That's going to turn the edges of the, of the light beam solid. So you want to make sure to avoid that. In general, the glow behind lens flare should always be behind the farthest thing from the camera. Let's wrap up by talking about a few things in the camera panel that you should be aware of. First of all, let's talk about segment memory. By default, segment memory is set to 2.2 megs. You can adjust this by editing the line in the config file that refers to segment memory. Now, Basically, segment memory is the amount of memory in bytes that LightWave needs in order to render out your image. It's basically, it's, it's not the amount of memory that's needed to actually do the rendering, but it's the amount of memory needed to maintain that frame, the final rendered image, in memory. So, for instance, let's say you are rendering at a custom size of, uh, let's just say 500 by 500. In order to figure out how much segment memory you need, in order to render in one segment, you would want to go to a calculator. And I'll just go out to the program manager and choose calculator. And we want to take 500 times 500 times 24. Okay, that's the number in bytes. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's 6 megs. Okay, 6 followed by 6 zeros. That's the memory in bytes needed to render in one segment. So if we go back in, and we're rendering 500 by 500. Let's change the segment memory to 4 megs. Okay, notice I can't render that in one segment. But if I change it to 6 megs, okay, that equals one segment. So that's how you adjust segment memory. And it's important to try to do it in one segment if you can. This is especially important when you're rendering your frame and you're using motion blur. Because the less number of passes, the less number of segments that it renders in, the faster the rendering will go. Okay. Now again, there's a trade-off here. If you don't have enough RAM, okay, I need 6 megs all by itself, 6 megs of free RAM, in order to maintain this image in memory. If I don't have that much RAM, I can't do it with 1 meg, and I'll have to use a lower segment memory. Now in Windows NT and Windows systems, you have virtual memory. So what's going to happen here is even if I set my segment memory high and I don't have enough RAM, it's going to page that to disk and try to render the thing in one segment. The problem with paging to disk is it's slower than real memory. So if you are paging, and you can watch that as soon as you start rendering, watch your hard drive light, and if it's going a lot, what I would recommend is lowering the segment memory so you render less 
you render more segments, but you're taking less memory to render. That way, if you can render everything in memory, it's still going to be faster than trying to do one segment page to your hard drive. For instance, let's say we're doing this with one meg each. Okay, that means I'd have to render in six segments, but let's say that one meg of memory is what I have left, and that allows me to render completely in memory. This may render faster than trying to do one big segment that's in virtual memory. Finally, let's talk about motion blur and how that relates. First of all, I'm going to go, let's just clear the scene to reset all the values. Let's just load up a simple object here. And I'm going to load up a ball. Okay. And let's just set up a camera view of this ball. And we're going to start there. Put a frame at zero. And let's move it to here and create a keyframe at frame five. Okay. Notice these little knots here. They represent the individual frames. Okay, where the ball is. Let's slide our frame slider. It jumps to the frame knot at each frame. Okay, so let's go to the one in the middle. Go to frame three. And let's actually size the ball down a little bit so we can, so it doesn't actually intersect the other frame. Okay, let's create a key at that point. Um, actually, Let's size it down for all. We want to keep it that size for all of the values. So that's at 0.43. Let's just, an easy way of doing this is to go into the motion graph and go to the size values, X scale, Y scale, and Z scale, and just drag these values down so they're all equal. And we don't have to be exact here. We'll just get it rather close. Okay. And finally for the Z scale. That way I don't have to go to all the other frames and input the values. It's kind of a quick way of doing it. Okay, so now my object stays relatively the same scale across the frames. At that keyframe, actually you don't even really need a keyframe there. I'm just going to delete it. Okay. But at the frame right there, let's turn on motion blur. And to use motion blur, we have to have some degree of anti-aliasing. So let's just use a low anti-aliasing level, which will render out five separate passes in, passes in Lightwave. Turn on motion blur. And what I'm going to do here is render this out so we can see what's happening. And it renders the ball. And then notice we, it's rendering separate individual frames of the ball for each pass. And it's going to blend those in with the original one. So we have five distinct balls here, each one slightly transparent. Okay, that gives us our artificial motion blur in Lightwave. Let's go back here. I'm going to turn on, go to the effects panel and just make the background a little lighter so we can see what we're doing better. Okay, now how far did it know to spread out that distance? Okay, well what we do is that's found in the camera panel. By default, the blur length, or how far the images are spread out, is set to 50%. That means it's going to make an, an image from halfway between the existing frame and the frame previous. So a 50% motion blur will make images blur them out halfway between that length. Okay, let's just change the blur length to something ridiculous like 200. Okay, 100% would set it back the exact distance between this frame and the previous frame. If we change it to 200% like we did, that means it's going to go back the distance of two frames. So remember that distance here. Let's just render this out. Notice that the separate images are spaced much further apart. As a matter of fact, they're spaced the distance of two frames. Okay. Now, notice we also have five distinct blurs. That's because we're rendering in low anti-aliasing, which does five passes. If we bump this up to medium, we're going to get a total of nine passes. Medium anti-aliasing gives you eight separate passes plus the original. Low gives you four passes plus the original. And high gives you 16 passes plus the original for a total of 17. Let's just set the anti-aliasing to medium, which will give us, remember, nine distinct passes, and render this out again. 
Now notice that when these balls render, this time they're a little bit closer because we're fitting nine images in that same distance, the, the distance of two keys. So we'll let this go. It's on the ninth pass. When we render it out, you'll see that we have more passes. Okay. Now obviously we're getting this, this stepping. Okay. Chances are you don't want to use really high motion blur values like this. Chances are you're going to want to use somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. Okay, now there is one other option with motion blur, and that's dithered motion blur. And what that does is, let's go back to low, but turn dithered motion blur on instead. We'll leave the blur length set at 200. Okay, and this time, let's use F9. Even though we're rendering at low, if you watch the, the status display, it's saying we're rendering segment 4A, 4B, 5A, 5B. This is actually using a field rendering type of algorithm to display the images. Even though we're rendering in low, it's still giving us twice as many images. As a matter of fact, we're getting one more image. Because remember, low anti-aliasing will give us five distinct images. If we turn on dithered motion blur, it doubles that. So we get 10 images in the same space, yet we're rendering with low anti-aliasing. Remember, if we bumped it up to medium anti-aliasing, we were only going to get nine distinct images. So we actually get a little bit better motion blur by using low with dithered motion blur. Although the time to render that is only significantly, fa significantly slower. For instance, let's say it takes a minute to render at low. It takes, let's call it two minutes to render at medium. To use low with dithered motion blur, which will give us a better motion blur effect, it's only going to take about a minute and, you know, a third of another minute, about a minute and a third to give us a little bit better motion blur for a little bit more time, but less time than it would take to go to medium. Okay, now ideally what you'd want to do, like I said, is render out, let's say, 25% blur. Let's use dithered and low again, and this time when we do this final render, we're going to get more images compactly around just 25%, which is the distance from this frame back to the previous frame, 25% would be a quarter of that distance. Okay, this is looking much more like you would expect a motion blur effect to look. The, the, we're still getting the steps, but we're getting them around the edges. And remember, we're still using low here. If we bump this up to high anti-aliasing and use dithered motion blur, we would have 34 distinct steps, and it would we probably wouldn't even see them at all. It would be really fine. If you want to achieve a nice film look to your video animations, here's some things I'd recommend. First of all, in the camera panel, turn on soft filter. This is going to give it more of like a soft film look. I'd use motion blur, and like I said, anywhere between 25 and 50 percent. Then the other thing you want to make sure is in the effects panel, you can use dither intensity and you might want to try a higher dither pattern and use animated dither. What this is going to do is try to give you like a film grain appearance. And because it's animated dither, that dither pattern is going to change and you might get kind of a more grainy look to it. In addition, in the camera panel, you want to make sure not to use field rendering. Field rendering is going to give your animation a very video feel to it. It's going to be very smooth, unlike film, which has more of a motion blurred, persistent of vision look. If you're going to do something that you want to look like film, don't use field rendering. Well, that's about all the time we have for this tape. Hopefully you've learned some techniques that will make your animations even better. I'm John Gross, and hope to see you soon.